countries with the most venomous animals in the world. So judging by this map, it seems like venomous animals don't really like the cold too much. They might also possibly prefer wetter climates as well. I do love these outliers though because there's a lot of confusing things going on here. For instance, how does almost all of Europe have less than 10 venomous animals whereas France has like 50? Wait, no, they have between 20 and 30 here. I'm going to assume that is entirely due to French Guyana down here in South America. That's got to be the thing that's bringing them up because there's actually only one place with less than 10 in all of this continent and that is Chile. I'm wondering if that mountain range really kind of keeps them safe from all the venomous animals. Like yeah, Peru, Ecuador, and Colombia have that same mountain range as well, but they also have territory on the other side. This is where I'm most worried about. Probably has the most venomous animals. So a lot of this is also going to come down to just how big your country actually is, except if you're near one of the poles as Canada has less than 10, but also perhaps closer to the equator because obviously Mexico is not as big as the USA, but they have way more venomous animals. A lot of islands seem to be really safe against these creatures. Madagascar and New Zealand are also some good examples, but I guess Indonesia is kind of an outlier, but uh, Indonesia has a, a lot of things going on in there. Interesting that East Timor has less than 10, so it must not be some of these islands. It might be just here or Java perhaps that's pulling them all down. Finally, let's just talk about the elephant in the room, the least surprising here, Australia with over 50. And it's funny how New Zealand has less than 10. Little bit surprised to see how Japan has so many. I mean, they're on an island and it does get quite cold, so I'm wondering how they got so many over there. The other big ones, Vietnam, India, a lot of places in Africa, of course, Brazil as well. Something that I think that's kind of being glossed over here, the micronation of Singapore has a lot. Singapore is extremely tiny. How did they manage to get so many? But if you're wondering who exactly is at the top, of course, it is who we all expected. They got the box jellyfish, the marbled cone snail, the blue ringed octopus. Oh, wait a second. Australia just has the animals with the most deadly venom. They don't have just in general the most venomous creatures. That's actually Mexico. The pronunciation of the nation of Mexico in Europe. As you can see, I'm speaking English and I just said Mexico. And it seems like that is the pronunciation that most of the European countries follow. The original native pronunciation is Mexico, which funny enough, the only country that's doing that is Portugal. Portugal. Portugal didn't even colonize Mexico. Why are they the only ones doing it right? They're close to the country that colonized Mexico. To be fair, the Spanish region of Galicia also says Mexico. Meanwhile, the majority of Spain is saying Mexico. That's what I thought the original pronunciation was. But the easternmost part of Spain or the Catalonian region, they also say Mexico, like everyone else in Europe. Looks like the Navarra region sometimes says Mexico. There's still so much to talk about here because why does Slovenia and then of all places Estonia say Mexico. These are three places I wouldn't expect to agree on this. Then finally, there's the Italians who say Mexico. 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 That Italian version is a little bit similar to the Portuguese version. Mexico. I guess it really shouldn't be surprising that Mexico's mother country is a little bit divided on this topic. They're just kind of always divided about language stuff. In 1903, a Vermont doctor bet $50 he could cross America by car. It took him 63 days, $8,000, and 600 gallons of gas. First thing I want to know is what kind of car was it? I'm actually amazed it didn't have to get towed or anything like that. I mean, did they even have tow services? back then? Man, you couldn't pay me to ride across the US in this. Keep in mind, it was 1903. Like, there wasn't gonna be a whole lot out there. I don't even know how much we could really trust those roads back then. The man had no maps, no car, and very little driving experience. What a chad. He even eventually picked up a dog in Idaho. I don't even think I've pointed out the best part about this story. He bet $50, but ended up spending $8,000 in the journey. <laughs> It's not about the money, it's about sending a message. Wait, maybe this is the best part. His only other car-related feat of note is a traffic ticket for breaking the six mile per hour speed limit in Burlington. The percentage of unbanked adults in the EU. Unbanked? So they don't have a bank at all. Sadly, I didn't even know you could do that. I mean, I know you can technically do that, but yeah, just looking at this German number, it seems to be extremely rare. 0 0.02. It actually goes lower than that. Denmark is literally at a 0%. Do they require by law that you put your money in a bank? I don't see how it could be literally zero. Yeah, all persons in Denmark must have so-called, um, this name, an ordinary bank account that the public authorities and certain companies can use. Belgium here is somewhat of an outlier near their neighbors. They're almost at 1%. There's Spain, which is at one6 
7%, but Portugal pretty high, 7.35%. That's definitely a lot more than Italy. The Nordics also pretty low, but the further south you go, the more high it gets. And then you might notice a little geographical trend as we head out towards eastward. Romania is the highest on the list at 30%. 30% of Romanians are unbanked? Sometimes I want to do this myself, like just keep all my money uh, below my mattress like they did in the old days. I feel like I would need to booby trap my house first though. I will admit, sometimes you don't want a bank account. You can't have negative $36 in real life. You gotta watch those overdraft fees and you'll get feed for not having enough money. The strength of the Brazilian passport. Obviously in red we have Brazil. And if you're a Brazilian citizen, you can go to almost any place in South America. Interesting Interestingly enough, you cannot go to French Guyana though. What's weird is you don't need a visa to go to France, but you do for French Guyana. There might just be like special things going on there or something. Now most of Latin America is cool with letting in Brazilians without a visa, except for Cuba and Mexico. I guess that Latin American rivalry goes hard. You'd need a visa required prior before your visit. You'd also need it for the US and Canada as well. But you could literally go anywhere in Europe. It's all opened. Now majority of Africa is a little bit more difficult you can get a visa when you get there. Visa on arrival or e-visa. Now, Brazilians shouldn't be singled out by some of these countries that require a visa. Uh, some of these countries just require a visa from every place. I know, like the US too. Interesting divide between South Korea and Japan. Usually these two mostly agree on a lot of this stuff. This type of stuff, this type of stuff, not other things. Just want to make that clear. What I find real weird though is that there are visa requirements for Mozambique and Angola, two former Portuguese colonies as well in Africa. I don't know, you'd kind of just think that there'd be like a Portuguese brotherhood going on there. You could just hop on in whenever you want. Also like how Brazil is in the BRICS alliance. BRICS is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. China is the only one that requires a visa prior though. I think China does that with a lot of nations though, so maybe that's why. Territories in the world which were never occupied by Western powers. By Western powers, they're probably mainly referring to Europe and the USA. So Ethiopia is not included because they were briefly occupied by the Italians. And then regions of Turkey are not included in this list too after the Ottoman Empire fell. They were going to carve that up. Same goes for regions of Saudi Arabia as well as China. They've had to deal with a lot on the coast. As you can see, the only full nation here that has never been touched by Western power is Thailand. I don't know how they dodged that bullet when like literally nobody else did. Or perhaps they shouldn't be included since there might be a small time period where they were occupied. I believe Russia and the Soviet Union counts as a Western power in this map. So that's why Central Asia as well as Mongolia is not red. But what about the Romans and Greeks? Wouldn't they have controlled this red area like way long ago? This gets really complicated as you can tell. Here is the highest rated video game from every country. So tallying up several different video game reviews from articles and websites, they were able to find out Tony Hawk Pro Skater 2 is number one in the USA. I can confirm this myself. I enjoyed that game as well back in the day. For Mexico, it's Kerbal Space Program. Maybe it's Poland and Mexico that cannot into space. In Canada, it's Mass Effect 2. What is this in Panama? Bugs, Fables, The Everlasting Sapling. What? Wait, I think I need to confirm that these are games that have come out of these countries that were rated really highly. Not necessarily the country's favorite game. Watch this be a total banger. These are the types of games I like anyways. Brazil with Horizon Chase World Tour. There's definitely going to be a lot of smaller titles. I think they come out of some of the smaller countries. Cyberpunk Bartender Action. Sounds epic, Venezuela. Germany's top rated game is really out of the park baseball. 2007? What about all those simulator games they're making? Who's giving them bad reviews? Of course, Poland with The Witcher 3. Not surprised about that at all. Tom Clancy's Splinter Cell coming out of Italy. I was wondering where Grand Theft Auto was going to be. Was Grand Theft Auto 4 made in the UK? Of course, is the only thing I know Iceland for EVE Online. Desktop Dungeons in South Africa. Assassin's Creed Black Flag came out of Bulgaria. I didn't know about that. World of Tanks, very popular in Belarus. <laughs> Wait, really? Cut the Rope came from Russia? Man, that was a classic back in the day. A mobile classic. Should have known this out of Sweden. I don't even know why we refer to it as Sweden anymore. This should just be Minecraft land. Oh, did Australia make Bioshock? Philippines with pretentious game. I find it interesting also some of the games on here that actually have like maybe a lower ranking, like that are only in the 70s, but they still got on the chart. That's nice. Oh man, of course Japan's got some bangers. It's kind of hard to choose. I guess that's what we're talking about this year today. Man, I remember being a kid waiting forever for Killzone 2 to come out. I didn't even know they actually released that game. I thought it was just in production for like five years. Or no, I'm thinking of Killzone 3, I think. 
I don't know. It doesn't matter. One of those games. I guess it's important to mention that these games are just the most highly rated, not necessarily the most popular. You probably actually have a better chance if the game isn't super popular, just getting like, you know, five good reviews. Each one of these quadrants in the United Kingdom have exactly the same amount of population. So obviously the point in which they split into fours really tells us a lot. The southern part or England really has just a ton of people. At least compared to this yellow square, they need to take up most of the island up here. But remember, Scotland has the highlands. It's kind of hard to fit people. Also probably gets pretty cold. I feel like I'm more surprised about the blue quadrant though. I mean, this is still pretty low with Wales included and parts of England and Northern Ireland. This is still a lot of stuff they need. Another way to look at this is the blue and yellow squares combined are 35 million people and just the red and green squares combined are 35 million people. So this line right here shows you how you can divide the country in half. I guess you could use this line to divide the country vertically as well. Ways in which the Great Lakes try to murder ships. There's an estimated 6,000 ships and over 30,000 lives that have been lost in the Great Lakes. One of them is a cresting failure when a large wave lifts the ship by the middle, causes a lot of stress right here. The other one is plowing when riding down a wave and sends you into the next. This is the worst in the Great Lakes because fresh water waves are spaced closer than salt water waves. That's something I would have never expected. Oh wait, this sounds actually way worse. Plowing to ground strike. There are parts that don't get that deep. There's bottoming. That's an interesting term. Big waves actually increases the chance the entire ship gets slammed into the sea floor. So chances are if you're near the coastline in the Great Lakes, uh, yeah, it's gonna be pretty shallow. Well, especially Lake Erie, that's for sure. And of course, if you're like trying to ride the channels as well. Man, just going through all these is freaking me out. I don't think I want to take a ship through the Great Lakes. There's also swamping. While this may seem like the dumbest and most avoidable, it's also the most common. This is when ships load too much in and then the water comes over. Yeah, I had no idea the Great Lakes were actually this dangerous. I'm assuming they got a lot of those kills probably way back in the day when we first discovered the Great Lakes. We probably had no idea what was going to go down here. And big thanks to my patrons. I am the kidnapper and I've moved Drew to a Patagonian Australia village. Australia is real. Drew I'm not a paid Argentine actor. The grandpa. slow depressing Drew portal Dernel collapse. Colored Asher wine. to Carl Wright, Wes, 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 Wes,